Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see you guys in the house of the Lord. We're here to worship and to praise God. So uh, would you please stand, as, uh, stand up as we worship together? Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together in your house. Lord, as we begin this service, I pray, Lord, that you may be with us, that your presence may be here. We give you all the glory and we give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
setting us free, oh Lord. There is none like you. Jesus, we give you all the glory and all the honor this morning. We recognize, Lord, that without you we wouldn't be here today. Lord, we just lay our lives down this morning so that you can be glorified, Heavenly Father. There is none like you. Jesus left for me. Oh, Jesus sent me. 
sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Sing for the freedom he has won.
just love you, Master. You are so beautiful in our presence. You are awesome in our presence, oh God. Age to age, you are still the same. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You're worthy to be praised in your house. You're worthy in our lives, Jehovah God. You're worthy in your church. Jehovah El Shaddai, the Almighty God. Jehovah Elion, the Most High God. Jehovah Elolam, the Everlasting God. The one who changes not. You are Jehovah Adonai, the sovereign God, the man of war, the God who never loses any battle. We give you praise. You are Jehovah Shabbat, the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Elohim, the only true God. The only true God. And to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb who was slain belong the power and the wealth and the wisdom and the strength and the glory and the honor and the praise. To the King eternal, to the King everlasting, to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We bow in your presence this morning in worship. We bow in your presence this morning in adoration. We bow in your presence today, O oh God. Out of reverence, out of love. And God as a church, we bow and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. We bow in your presence and say, Worthy, worthy. Worthy is the Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, and who is to come. Blessed Jesus, you're altogether wonderful. You're altogether amazing and awesome and glorious. What a mighty God we serve. Lord, I study in this altar and I speak the healing power of God in this place. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, take over this service. Freely move in this place. May go with us today, fellowship with us today. Have your precedence in this place. Lord, take over our lives, take over our hearts, take over our finances, take over our families. We surrender to you, O God. We surrender it all to you. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. Do with us, Lord, as you wish this morning. Use us for your glory. Accept our praises. Accept our worship, O oh God. Lord, we don't have anything to give to you. We give you ourselves. We give you ourselves, O oh God. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our families. Have your way in our marriages. Have your way in our children. Have your way in our careers. Have your way, oh God. Have your way in your church. Jehovah God, have your way in your church. Lord, I speak peace to those who are oppressed by different situations. Give them peace, Jehovah God. Peace that transcends understanding. Peace of mind, peace of heart, the peace of God. Father God, I speak breakthrough in our situations, breakthrough in our finances, breakthrough in our work, breakthrough in our careers, breakthrough in our businesses. Oh God, arise. Let your enemies be scattered. 
I speak peace between mothers and daughters. I speak peace between fathers and sons. I speak peace between husbands and wives. I speak the peace of God between children and parents. I speak your peace, dear God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, we love you, Master. We bless your name, O oh God. We exalt you, O oh King. You are worthy, O oh God. Jehovah El Roy, the Lord who sees us. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord our shepherd. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Jehovah Shidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Mekodesh Kem, the Lord our sanctifier. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. God, you are our rock. You are our foundation. You are our hope. You are our strength. We lay all our burdens to you. We bring every burden to the cross. Have your way, Master. The night the Lord Jesus was arrested and betrayed to be crucified. After dinner with his disciples, he took bread in the midst and gave thanks. Then he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take as often as you would in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after supper, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Take as often as you would in remembrance of me. Every time we take communion, we commemorate the Lord's death until he returns. Every time we take communion, we communion the saints, both here on earth and in glory. All saints, we commune together, we fellowship together. This is the communion meal. It's also the commemoration meal. Every time we take communion, we proclaim power in the blood of Christ. We speak healing to our bodies, healing to our families, healing to our situations. Every time we take this communion, we profess there is power in the blood of Christ. The cross is our refuge. The cross is our strength and our hope. I'll ask you to be seated for a few moments. And when you get the communion elements, please wait for the rest. Scripture tells us to wait for one another when we are coming to the Lord's table. And to examine ourselves. For us not to take the communion in an unworthy manner. And every time you come to the Lord's table feeling guilty of your sins, you are taking this communion in an unworthy manner. This is a celebration meal. We celebrate the fact that the Lord took away our sins. We celebrate the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And this communion, every time we take it, we are communing with the other saints. If there is anyone who has offended you, you must forgive them before you take of this communion. And that's why Paul says, let's examine ourselves. Let me give you a moment just to examine your heart. And I'm asking you to do two things. Number one, to really thank God for the forgiveness of sins, to approach the throne of mercy and grace with confidence, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that the Lord will never hold anything against you. And you must come to this table having forgiven anyone who has offended you. Gracious Lord, we sanctify these elements in your presence this morning. May you use them for your glory as we partake of this communion 
I speak the healing in the blood of Jesus. I speak the healing of our bodies. Every virus, every vermin, every disease causing organism within us will be defeated by the precious blood of Christ. As we take this communion, we decree and proclaim healing for our families. We forgive those who have offended us, and we come to your table asking for your forgiveness and your cleansing. We speak healing in our finances. We speak healing in every situation in our lives. May you strengthen us, O oh God. We proclaim life to everyone who is partaking of this Lord's table this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's children say, Amen. Amen. Let's take the bread together. And the cup. Shall we stand? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the blood that was shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for your body that was broken, that we may be made whole. By your stripes, we are healed. You became poor, that we may become rich. You became a curse on that old rugged cross, that we may be blessed of God. You are forsaken by the Father, that we may never be forsaken. You are shamed to cover our shame. This part on you that you may give us your glory. And you died that we may live. You gave your life that we may live eternally with you, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory. We honor you, Lord. We honor you, Father. We bless your name. We love you this morning. In Jesus' name. And God's children say, Amen. Amen. While still standing, I want us to profess our faith in Christ. One, two, three. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ. was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body. <laughs> Amen. I want us to make our 2023 confession. Are you ready? Bring some oomph, some charisma, some charm, some smile. As we do this confession, say it from the bottom of your heart. One, two, go. I am loved by God. I am blessed. I am highly favored. I am healthy. I am happy. I am good looking. I am in great shape. I am secure, I am motivated, I am positive, I am valuable, I am needed, I am determined, I am purposeful, I am successful, I am prosperous, I am victorious, I am an achiever, I am empowered, I am loving, I am peaceful, I am forgiving, I am patient, I am kind, I am generous, I am well able, as Jesus is in glory, so I am here on earth. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Are you well? Yeah, yeah. What a joy to see you again. You're looking good. Tell your neighbor you're looking good. <laughs> Ah, good. Let's take a few moments and give the Lord of our offerings and our tithes. Giving is a very interesting concept in the church. Every time we give the Lord, we give him the mandate to multiply 
what is in our hands. Some of you will remember a time Jesus took two fish and five loaves from a boy. And because that child surrendered to Christ, 5,000 households were fed. And there were 12 leftover baskets that the apostles carried home. Every time you give to the Lord, you are telling the Lord to multiply what you have. You are trusting him to be Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides all our needs. You are basically saying, you know, it's not your hard-earned money. It's not your sweat. It is the goodness of God. It is the faithfulness of God. It is the generosity of God. That's why we give with joy. It's a way of worship and thanksgiving to God. If you are visiting us for the first time, you can use the options on the screen. Now, as we continue with the 21 days of prayer and fasting, I want to suggest, if you are able to go to my YouTube channel, there is a message I preached in this church, dubbed Seven Reasons Why You Should Fast. I want to encourage you to look for that message because we should always have a reason for what we do. We should always have a why. Why we do what we do. Please just look for it. Even if you have fasted for many years, there is always something to learn or to refresh what you know. Now, this week, on Friday, we are going to have some prayer video from 7 to 9 p.m. This is this Friday, the 20th of January. Uh, we are going to use this particular night to climax our 21 days of prayer and fasting as a way of concluding the three weeks of prayer and fasting. If you're new to this church, the last three weeks, we were doing chain fasting. Everybody took a day or more to pray and fast together. So I think it's great we conclude together. This was not my original idea. One of the church members requested we do this, and this excited me. Uh, for us just to come together, pray together. When we come, I will be leading us into prayer in small portions, into worship, into praise, into thanksgiving, into intercessory, which is praying for others, and then into petition, praying for our own needs. So we are going to serve prayers in small meals and uh, in, the, in the Lord's presence. Well, it's time for the word of God. Tell your neighbor you're going to learn something today. Are you glad to be in church? I'm excited to see you. And uh, I want to speak on a very exciting subject. When God is silent. When God is silent. What do you do when it feels like God is doing nothing? Maybe you've been trusting God for your family, or you've been trusting God to start your own family, but God seems silent. Maybe you've been trusting God for your finances, or for promotion in your place of work, or even for business breakthrough. But it seems not forthcoming. Maybe you've been trusting God for your own healing or for the healing of a loved one, but they are still unwell, and you're asking yourself many questions. Am I not praying? What is not happening? Why isn't God answering my prayers? Why is God silent with me? If you were to drive from here to the White House in Washington, D.C., Chances are, Google Map will give you directions until you hit I-85. And once you hit I-85, Google Maps might end up being quiet on you for about 300 miles until the need for the next turn. 
you may not hear from the Google Maps again. And perhaps the guys who developed this app learned something about the nature of God. When God gives you direction, usually he doesn't waste words. He won't speak until the next direction. You find God speaking to Abraham at the age of 75, promising them a son and promising him to be a father of many nations. And then God seems silent until Abraham is a hundred years old. If I had a whole day to teach you on this subject, I would show you most of the things we read in scriptures. God spoke very few times to people. Many things we keep reading. For example, even in the ministry of Christ, you see God speaking when Jesus is born and when the baby Jesus needs to go to Egypt and then come back to Israel, and then God is silent. In the very life of Christ, we don't hear God speaking until the time to launch the ministry when he was 30. And in his public ministry, the Lord himself, we only find the Father speaking three times during the baptism, the transfiguration, and just before the cross. So this is not unusual with God. God does keep silence many times. In fact, the psalmist was very disturbed by the silence of God. He asked in Psalms 13, How long, Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord, my God, give light to my eyes or I'll sleep in death. Here is a man who was anointed as a teenager, yet... He is bemoaning the silence of God. Here is a man who had experienced breakthrough after breakthrough, killing the lion, killing the bear, killing Goliath, killing the Philistines, celebrated by the whole nation, from a shepherd boy to a king, yet he's lamenting about the silence of God. Here is a man whom God promised that there will always be a king in his throne, from his own loins. But four times he's asking God, how long, how long, how long, how long? He feels like God's silence is forever. Look at verse 1. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And I know there is someone listening to me. You've been praying and fasting and trusting God but then it seems like God is not answering your prayer and you're asking the same question that the psalmist asked. It feels like forever. This man of God lived for 75 years, but he's feeling like God has stayed forever. I don't know whether that describes you, but for me, I've gone through those seasons of the silence of God. The question I'm asking right now, why would God be silent? Why does God go silent on the children he loves? Why would he keep quiet on us when we need him the most? There could be many reasons. I want to share with us three reasons I found in scriptures. They may not be the only reasons, but these are some of the things God revealed to me through his word. Why is God usually silent? Number one. God's timing. God's timing is not our own timing. God does not follow our clock. He does not fit into our schedules. He lives outside time. Galatians 4.4, 4, Scripture says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. Yes, God has such a thing as his set time. Not your set time. God God said time. God doesn't answer our prayers in our own timing. And that's what frustrates most of us. He has his own timing. Father Abraham, the father of faith, got frustrated with God's silence. He had to make another arrangement with his wife and Hagar to get a son. 
they felt like God was too silent, so we need to think through what God was saying and come up with another plan. Yet God was clear. He was to bless Abraham through Sarah. But this great man of faith, even him, he lost his faith in God, in God's silence. 25 years of silence is no joke. And ears are advancing. So many times we get frustrated because God does not follow our clock. Because it's never too late with God. When the Israelites were living in Egypt, God said in Exodus 23, 28 to 30, I'll set the hornet ahead of you to drive the Hivites, Canaanites, and Hittites out of your way. But I'll not drive them out in a single year, because the land would become desolate and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I'll drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. Here are people wondering, why wouldn't God drive out all our enemies at once? We need the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites out of the land. And God says, if I do that, the land will be too vast for you. You will have another enemy, the wild animals. I'll remove one enemy, and another enemy will defeat you. There are many times God does not allow us to get into sudden breakthrough because it will destroy us. Often than not, when we get inheritance, it destroys us. When we get sudden breakthrough, we become too proud even to relate with our peers, even to come back to church. A lot of people, one promotion, they can't come back to church anymore. One degree, and they are too proud to pray or even to come to church. And they wonder why God does not take them to the next level. And that's why God prefers to bless us little by little, what we can handle. Scripture says in Habakkuk chapter 2, write the vision, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. Sometimes God will give you a vision for a distant future. Can you imagine that God told Abraham he would become a father of many nations? Yet God was speaking about the church. Abraham may have thought about literal children from his own loins. God was talking about all kindreds, all nations, all, na all races, all peoples, all tribes that will come to Christ as the children of Abraham, the children of faith. Can you imagine God gave David a vision that he's going to be the father? His kingdom will never lack a king. And that prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. It's about the millennial reign of the Christ, that his throne will last forever. We know from history that this kingdom was divided and scattered all around the world. After David died, the kingdom was divided into the north Israel and Judah in the south. And finally they were scattered. By the time the Messiah was born, they were not even governing themselves. They were under the Roman Empire. So when God was saying that there will never lack somebody in charge of the throne of David, he was talking about the Messiah. Because God has a grand scheme that is bigger than your plan, a master plan. So your own plan must fit in God's master plan. So often than not, God has given us a plan that is far bigger than where we are. So he says, write down the vision, because it may tarry, that it will surely come to pass. Now the second reason why sometimes God is silent it is because God is working on us. And when God is taking you through a class, you must pass through the lessons, every lesson, before you can go to the next level. You can't skip any of God's lessons. Now, it is amazing that when the Israelites left Egypt, God took them through a longer route. There was a very short route that would have taken them only 14 days, from Egypt to Israel, yet they went throughout the wilderness for 40 good years. Why? Because with the slavery mentality they had, they would have went back, gone back to Egypt after meeting the first enemy. That's not my discovery. That's what God said. 
He gave the reason why they had to go through the route of the Red Sea. Exodus 13, 17 to 18. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. After staying in the wilderness for 40 years, they were ready for battle. So what happened? There was a shorter route. God said, no, these guys are thinking like slaves, reasoning like slaves. They are not yet ready to master themselves. If they, if they meet the first battle, they will go back to Egypt forever. So God took them through the Red Sea. First of all, he played with their psychology. He let them see, now I had to part the waters of the Red Sea, and I brought back the waters. There is no return. You have reached a point of no return because for you to go back to Egypt, you have to deal with the sea. That is the first thing he did. And then for 40 years, he took them through the school of faith. Everyone who was 20 years and above still doubted God. They all perished in the wilderness. It is their children who dare to trust God, those who are born in the wilderness. They are the ones who trusted God and they were ready to meet enemies. Can you imagine? They had to deal with 31 kingdoms. Yet when they were living in Egypt, God said they cannot even fight one enemy, the Philistines. But after God dealt with them, and developed a character in them, they were now ready to fight the Tuan kings. They actually fought them and conquered them. But when they were living in Egypt, without slavery mentality, they could not deal with only one kingdom. How long you stay in the wilderness depends on how fast you master the lessons of God. Because God's classes, you cannot cheat through them. You cannot microwave them. God will allow you to stay in the wilderness until you learn his lessons, what he's teaching you. Only then will you step into your promises. God's promises never fail. People fail. So these guys never reached the land of promise, but their children did. If you don't learn the lessons, these blessings may skip you and reach your children. The Bible says why God takes us through these classes. Essentially, is to develop character in us. Because God does not want to take us a place where our character cannot keep us. God does not want your gifts to take you where your character cannot keep you. So Romans 5, 3 to 5, the Lord says, Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. A hope that does not disappoint. A hope that does not put us to shame. If you have no character and God raises you in music or in preaching or in whatever else, or maybe you become a president or a governor, lack of character will bring you to shame. Lack of character will embarrass you. So God hardly lifts us up to a place where we are on the spotlight, beyond where our character can maintain us. So he takes us through some suffering to produce perseverance. What's that? Endurance tenacity. And that endurance produces character. Character is what you can do when nobody is watching you. Character is who you are if nobody is watching you. If nobody would ever discover what you're doing, what would you do? Knowing you're doing it for the audience of one, our Father in heaven, who sees everything done in secret. What you can do when you're all alone, when you know God is with you, that is character. Now, that character produces hope. Hope in God. Hope in his promises. A hope that does not disappoint. So sometimes, God is silent because he's taking us through classes. And how long you dwell in that class depends on how fast you learn the lesson. The third reason why God is silent is God does not like to be mistaken. You know, in this life, we all have lookalikes. I don't know whether you have ever met your lookalike. Have you ever met your lookalike? <laughs> and uh, there are many, let me mention maybe some two popular lookalikes. 
Now, Rihanna has a lookalike by the name Priscilla Beatrice. Now, if you saw those two girls, you would never know who is the true Rihanna. Even if we had a picture, you wouldn't even recognize who is the true Rihanna. I apologize. The media team didn't want you to see the pictures. It's boys in the media team, and they are jealous of Rihanna. So we understand them. Now, Kate Middleton is another one with a lookalike by the name Heidi Egan. They look so similar that in the streets of London, sometimes people go greeting Heidi Egan instead of Kate Middleton. It's my hope Prince William wouldn't confuse who is their wife if the two girls were dressed the same. But my point is this, God has no lookalike, and he never likes being mistaken. And I could give you just a couple of examples. When the children of Israel were crossing the Red Sea, God ensured that he could not be mistaken. The sea was ahead of them, and uh, yeah, you can take them through that slowly so that they see what I was talking about. So the sea was ahead of them, and the Egyptian military was behind them the strongest army in the history of mankind. They were literally between the rock and a hard place. And they knew that they knew that they knew only God could deliver them. He did not want to be mistaken. When they were in the wilderness, God fed them with manna, the bread of angels for 40 years. If you have ever been to the Sahara like me, where rain can stay the whole year, where they did not plant wheat, where there were no Walmarts and Targets and Publics and Kroger near them. Yet he continued to provide bread for 40 years in a manner he could not be mistaken. When they were crossing the River Jordan, God waited until the Jordan River banks had burst. Only a miracle would make them cross the River Jordan and step into the promises of God. God waited until Sarah's womb was dead, and Abraham had no seed. He was past the seed-bearing age. Don't ever forget this. They conceived when Abraham was 99 years old. Even today, a 99-year-old man cannot conceive. He's passed by his childbearing date. And at that moment, God said, now, guys, you're ripe for a miracle. It is time to release baby Isaac in a manner you don't confuse who is doing it for you. What I'm trying to say is that many times God waits until you hit rock bottom for you not to confuse this is the hand of God. When God answers our prayers, he does it in such a manner. He will not leave you guessing this is the hand of God. He will wait until you run out of status to come through for you. He'll wait until things are so thick in your marriage for him to come through for you. Sometimes he'll wait until you lose hope for a husband or for a wife. I was in a marriage seminar in the year 2008, and I said I want the eldest couple and the youngest couple to come. And I explained who is the eldest couple. The funny thing is the eldest couple was the youngest couple. So when I said I want the eldest couple to come, a couple walked. The guy was 75 years old. The woman was 72 years old. They had just married two weeks ago. They came straight from their honeymoon. So they were the youngest couple in the house, but they were the oldest by age. True story. My mercy there is my witness. So they took away my two presents for the youngest couple and the oldest couple. <laughs> You know what? It's never too late with God. And what is interesting, this was a marriage seminar. And, I, and I'm not talking about people out there who don't know what they are doing. These are two university lecturers who met at the age of 75 and 72 and married. I followed them through their pastor a w weeks later. They were happily married. I don't want to describe their honeymoon. It's never too late with God. God waited until Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire. 
That is the only time the miracle will not be mistaken. And the fire was so hot that the guys, the soldiers, who threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the fire, died of the flames, not of the furnace, of the flames. That is the time the Lord came for their rescue. And he opened the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, I know we threw three men. I am not going mad. And in fact, the fourth guy who is walking with them looks like the son of God. So God got glory because the situation could not be mistaken. This is the hand of God. God waited until Daniel was in the den of lions. The lions were so hungry that the guys who had thrown Daniel there, when they were thrown there with their wives and their children, the account in Daniel 6 is that before they hit the, the, the floor of the den, they were already crushed, all their bones by the lions. They were that hungry. And the king knew God would save Daniel. He never got sleep the whole night. He woke up early in the morning. How do you go to look for a man you've thrown to hungry lions? The king knew the God of Daniel is the God of heaven. He went early in the morning and asked him, Daniel, has your God saved you? And he found, yes, he did. The age of God closed down the lion's mouth. God did this miracle in a manner that King Darius made a decree all over Persia and Mead. No other God will be worshipped except the God of Daniel. For no other God can save like this. Ladies and gentlemen, when God comes through for you, he will do it in such a manner you will give God glory. Masse and I went looking for a house to worship. We were kicked away from three places after we launched the church. A whole month, we went place after place after place looking for a place of worship and success free. Only once we got a tiny place and they charged us $2,000 a month. A tiny place. One toilet for children and pastor and everyone else. No Sunday school room, no baptistry, no prayer chambers. No Sunday school room, no South place. Very tiny place, $2,000. At that point, I realized all my efforts are futile. And I changed strategy. And I went on my knees in prayer and fasting. And when I changed my strategy and surrendered to God, we got this facility, zero charges. We don't pay anything for this place. Amen. That is the God we serve, who many times waits until we surrender, until we learn to seek his face, until we surrender all. It's easy to sing that song, I surrender all. But God comes when there's nothing you're holding back. You surrender all to him. Jesus, God in flesh, just to give you an illustration how he waited for people to be desperate. He waited until Lazarus was buried for four days. Lest anybody says, medically speaking, you can be in a coma. He waited until the man had begun to rot. And then he knew this now cannot be mistaken. That the life and the resurrection has come for the aid of mother and Mary for their brother. I have seen God waiting until a marriage is dead. I've seen God waiting until a business is dead. I've seen God waiting until a church has reached rock bottom and everybody surrenders to God. There was a Canaanite woman who went to Jesus from the place from the land of Sidon and Tyre. And she said to Christ, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Matthew 15, 22 to 23. Jesus did not answer a word. Jesus did not answer a word. Jesus did not answer a word. Many of you here, if the pastor ignored you, you will never come back to church again. Not so with this woman. 
She went on her knees and said, Lord, you've got to do something. This demon is about to kill my daughter. Then the Lord told her something interesting to, that looked like he was sending her away. He said, you know what? I was only sent to the Lordship of Israel. You are Gentile. You are outside my jurisdiction. You are outside the domain for which I was sent, my mission field. You couldn't send this woman away. She said she began to worship him. She went on her knees. And then the Lord realized she's not going away. The disciples said, we can assist in sending her away. But she was not going to leave. She was on her knees crying and asking for God's assistance. And then the Lord said, you know, it is not right for me to give you, to give dogs the bread of children. That's a very strong word. It sounds like an insult for those who don't understand the culture those days. The Gentiles popularly referred, sorry, the Jews used to call the Gentiles dogs. So Jesus was trying to quote their culture, how the culture perceived the Gentiles. But the woman said, that's right, Lord, but guess what? The dogs do eat from the clumps that fall from the master's table. Lord, you have invited the children, but they have not responded to your invitation. They are not coming for the bread. Yes, I may be a dog, but at least the dog can eat the, left, can eat the leftovers and the remains and the broken pieces that are falling off the master's table. I'm not asking for the children's bread. I know healing belongs to the children. I'm not asking for the children's bread. I'm asking, can I take the clumps because they're not coming? Can I take the broken pieces? And Jesus said, I've never seen such faith all over Israel. Jesus only said that twice. To this woman who was a Gentile and to the centurion general, Matthew 8 from verse 5, who was also a Gentile. I believe with all my heart, this engagement Jesus had with this woman, apparently quiet, was meant for teaching the church. He knew how she would respond. Being the omniscient God in flesh, he knew what would be her response. And he was doing this to challenge many of us here who pray for something once or twice. And we say maybe God has already closed that door. Maybe God does not want me to have that prayer answered. So what do we do when God is silent? I want us to pick three lessons from this Canaanite woman. How did she respond? And can we pick some three lessons from her this morning? Number one, she had faith. She called Jesus, Jesus, son of David. She called Jesus by his messianic name. Basically by saying, son of David, she was saying, I know who you are. You are the Messiah. You can do it. She had faith that Jesus would do it. You know, Jesus is never moved by your need or your pain. Your pain and your need moves the heart of God. But your faith moves the hand of God. And this is the confusion in the church today. You think because of the magnitude of your problem, God will lack sleep. There were very many needy people in Israel at that time, and that did not move Christ. The Lord moved when somebody acted in faith. What's faith? When they knew that they knew that they knew what they're asking for will be done. Faith is when you expect your prayer to be answered. There is no iota of doubt in your heart. And your heart is always betrayed by your mouth. You pray one thing, you say another thing. It is easy to tell us, I have faith, this person will be healed. I have faith, this business will do well. But when you open your mouth, it reveals whether you have faith or not. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your day-to-day -day conversations either reveal your faith or betray your faithlessness. Your tongue will always tell us where your heart is. This woman did not expect anything less than that miracle. Some of you will recall there was a lame man who used to sit at the gate of the temple. 
And he was in his 40s. And he was looking for money. And Peter and John said, that's not our business to go dishing out money. We are not going to give you what you're asking for and you continue begging here for years. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk and go work. That's my own version. And the people marveled. The people were shocked. They looked at Peter as though he had unique power or he was very holy. Every time we see a miracle, we keep thinking this man of God is very holy or he has unique power. So Peter tells them in Acts 3, 12, why look ye so earnestly on us in modern language? Why are you staring at us? As though by our own power or holiness we have made this man to walk. Do you know why a lot of you run from church to church, crusade to crusade, looking for miracles? It's because you imagine somebody has some power. You imagine somebody's holiness causes miracles. Peter is saying you are lost if you're thinking like that. It's not about our power or our holiness. There is nothing to do with us that made this man to walk. Then he gives the answer why this guy walked. Verse 16. And his name, Jesus. His name, two things. His name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. What made this man to walk? The name of Jesus has power. And faith in that name. I must caution us though, this is not a magic name that anybody can use. It's a relational name. The sons of Sceva tried to invoke the name of Christ. It didn't work. They tried to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. The demons ended up beating them and telling them they have no relationship with that name. They told these seven sons of Sceva, Yes, Jesus, I know, Paul, I know. But who are you? Who gave you the right to use this name? This is not a magic name. This is a name that is based on a relationship. It's a relational name. So when you have a relationship with Christ because you are a child of God and you have faith that what you ask the Lord, he will do it, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lepers will be cleansed in Jesus' name. So Peter explains miracles happen when we have absolute faith in Christ. That woman had faith in Christ. I didn't say that. Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. I have not seen such faith all over Israel. That's what moved me into action. That's what Jesus was saying. Faith, the ability to expect what you have prayed to happen exactly as you prayed. What lesson can we learn from this woman? Number two, when the Lord is silent. Number two, she was persistent. She was not going to let Jesus go. She knew only Christ could answer this miracle. And she was going to stay on the altar horns until her prayer was answered. Hebrews 10, 35 to 36. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you receive what he has promised. Four things. Confidence, perseverance, will, promise. Be confident God will do it. Persevere. Be patient. Hold on in prayer. Be sure, number three, you're in the will of God. God never answers any prayer outside of his will. So you can't say when you are somebody's mistress for God to make it work. God doesn't answer such prayers. God doesn't answer prayers outside his will. You cannot be trusting God to bless a business founded on stolen money. Anything we trust must be based on the will of God. You cannot want to do a miracle for your own glory. God comes through when he knows that he knows that he knows he's going to receive glory. If by any means you're trying to gain your own popularity, you're outside the will of God. So don't throw away your confidence. The writer of Hebrews says it will be richly rewarded. Guess what? 
If you don't draw your confidence, if you wait patiently on God, stay on that lane of his will. You're going to get his promises. Number three and the last one. What can we learn from this woman? She was specific. And this is one item a lot of Christians miss. What was her prayer item? She said, Lord, my daughter is demon-possessed. This demon is killing her. How many people can even admit that their loved one is demon-possessed? How many of us don't admit when we are depressed, when we are sick, when we've lost a job, when we need a miracle, maybe in immigration, when we need a miracle? When you go to a doctor, what works is when you keep your shame down and you see exactly what you're going through. There is never shame in what you're going through. Some diseases look like they're embarrassing to talk about. If somebody is suffering from syphilis or herpes or gonorrhea and their genitals are swollen, it can be embarrassing. But there are not two ways to it. You go to a doctor, you've got to remove those clothes. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you'll not be treated. And that's exactly what the Lord is asking us. Here is the deal. Come as you are. Stop hiding things. Say exactly what is ailing you. How can a woman who is not a Christian know that the daughter is demon-possessed? And Christians today cannot identify demonic oppressions. There were some two blind men who came to Jesus. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. But they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus could see their blind. Believe me, Jesus could see their need. But he asked them, what do you want me to do for you? He didn't want to make assumption. Why? So that God can be given the glory. When God answers prayers that we have not prayed, we don't give him credit. We think it's our intelligence or hard work, our maneuvering, our networking, our wisdom, our papers, our qualifications got us the job. But when we hit rock bottom and we cry unto God for that job, we cry unto God for that promotion, we cry unto God for that relationship, we cry unto God for that marriage, we cry unto God for that healing. When that happens, we give God the credit, we give God the glory. So Jesus asked blind people, it is clear to everyone what these guys want. But he still asked them, what do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. We want our sight. I'll never forget how President Nelson Mandela in 1963 went into that court when they were saying they are going to lock him for 27 years. He repeated over and over again, we want our freedom. We want our freedom. We want to be treated equally, irrespective of color of our skin. He was clear in his mind what he was looking for. And the Lord wants us to come with specific items. What exactly are you looking for? Um, Lord, I'm looking for a husband who is handsome, six feet tall, not like our pastor, five, seven. No, 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 no. I'm looking for a guy who is this color. Our pastor is too small. I want a guy who can lift me up a bit muscles. God, that's what I'm looking for. This guy needs to be prayerful. That's what I'm looking for, a God-fearing dude. Hey, God, I don't want a guy who is not working. I don't want to be providing to a man who is watching TV. This is what I'm looking for. God wants you to be specific. Hey, young man in the house, this is the girl I'm looking for. A lot of us are too shy to pray for a beautiful girl. I'm telling you the truth. God is my witness. When I was praying for a wife, I told God, I'm praying for a beautiful woman. It's okay to tell God even the qualifications you're looking for. It's okay. What's wrong with a girl who's gone to school? What's wrong with a girl who's hard working? It's okay. I'm not saying you have to. I'm saying if that's your desire. Does that make sense? I want a girl with this type of a hair. It's okay to be specific, to be honest. All the things I was praying for were fulfilled in mercy. You can imagine my shock when I went to mercy and she told me, no, you're not my type. I went into prayer and fasting. That is the first time I knew where Maurice Ruro was preaching from. I went there and I went back full of anointing and the girl said, yes. 
You've got to be specific what you're looking for. When you're looking for a business, I know my calling is to reach professionals like you. So when I'm praying, I'm that particular. God, bring people who can submit to my anointing, to the grace over my life. People who can respect the calling in my life. Anyone, oh God, who will struggle to submit to my anointing, don't allow them to come through that church. Because I was never meant to reach everyone. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Not everybody who can hear my voice, not everybody who can follow my teachings, not everybody who can process my way of teaching. Are you listening to me? I'm asking you right now, when you're praying for your child, be very specific. This is what I'm praying for for my daughter. Do you know my children, 17 and 15, I still pray for their partners. Sometimes they even pray, they even laugh during prayers. They try to tell me, Dad, slow down. We are not looking for a life partner. Can you imagine even this week, Zig is 15 and I still prayed for his wife. He can laugh at me right now, but soon than later he will not laugh at me. He will say, thank God for my daddy who used to invest in my prayers. And I like them knowing what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a beautiful wife for you. Don't just bring anything here. I'm prophesying a beautiful woman for you. And a prayer warrior. That's what I'm prophesying. And I like them knowing that I want to be specific with these prayers. And you must notice one more thing about these blind men. People told them to keep quiet. They told them, don't go for the altar call. It's embarrassing. The more the people told them to shut up, the louder they shouted. I don't care what you're thinking about me. I am blind. I'm going for that altar call. You're not keeping me here. I'm going where Jesus is. Many times when we ask people to come for prayers, there are people who are pulling others back. Nobody's inviting you to Jacob. We are inviting you to Christ. I close with the words of Rick Warren. The instructor is always silent when the test is given. When God is silent in your life, you are being tested. That's powerful. You all have done tests, school tests. And you know for a fact, the instructor does not talk when the test is going on. And Rick Warren is saying, let's learn a lesson from there. When the test is going on, the instructor is quiet. When you are done with the test, he begins to talk to you. Ladies and gentlemen, did the Lord speak to you today? I want us to pray. And I first want us to pray for Jackie. Jackie, come over here. And uh, her mom has been unwell. Just turn here with me. And uh, I want to give mommy a prayer show. So I want to request the rest of us as a church, please, uh, mom, if you don't remember anything else, call her mom. She qualifies to be a mom to everybody here. I call her mom, and I want us to trust God together for her mother's healing. And I'm also going to pray for this prayer shawl. When it touches mom this afternoon, she'll be healed in Jesus' name. Can we make a prayer for mom? Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for our loving mom. We thank you for the ears you have given us, mom, Jehovah God. We are not complaining. These are many ears. We bless your name, some Men and women never saw their parents. Some kids never grew up with their mom and their dad. Father, we thank you for the gift of mom. And right now, in the name above all names, we speak healing over mom. In the name of Jesus, the name above all names, 